Okay, this is the lecture, um, just going over the beginning of the chi-squared hypothesis testing worksheet. Um, for this worksheet, make sure that you uh, read the Introductory to Business Statistics Chapter 11 right here, or you can click on this link, and it'll bring you to the textbook. Uh, read through this entire overview sheet. Um, there's uh, YouTube videos that are posted to Canvas. Um, then complete all the homework problems. There's only two problems on this sheet. Um, well, two hypothesis tests. Uh, one is the goodness of fit hypothesis test. One is testing for independence. Um, and you'll see the difference between the two of those. And then uh, take the uh, uh, complete the chi-squared hypothesis testing portion of the final project. Um, what's really important about this is there are two um, chi-squared hypothesis test portions. Uh, there's one in test for independence, and then there is one that is... Uh, goodness of fit, you only have to do one of the two. You don't have to do both. So just look at them and determine which one you want to do. Then submit a picture of, uh, or submit this actual document completed um, on Canvas. Um, and there's a link on Canvas for you to be able to submit it. And then uh, take the quiz on uh, chi-squared hypothesis testing. So... Um, chi-squared is definitely different. We're no longer using a normal distribution. We are actually um, looking at and comparing uh, observed frequencies to expected frequencies. And one of the best ways to do that is with contingency tables. And when you have a contingency table, which we've worked with contingency tables before, um, you have, uh, like right here, this is a contingency table. Um, you have uh, three different computer operating systems or three different uh, you know, means of uh, computing. Then you have how many uh, students uh, actually use those different uh, machines. And based on national market share, how many should use those uh, machines um, based on a national market share. And so you've got a contingency table um, based on the these two variables um so we're dealing with contingency tables and then goodness of fit is a hypothesis test uh, that compares the expected and observed values um in order to look for significant differences within uh non uh parametric uh variables and then uh the test for homogeneity, uh, a test used to draw a conclusion about whether two populations have the same distribution. Um, and so we're going to be looking at that. And then also uh, the um, test for independence. Um, and we'll get into that as well, which is basically a hypothesis test that compares expected and observed values, just like goodness of fit. But uh, for independence, the expected values are going to be different as compared to goodness of fit. Uh, they're going to be the same. Um, so, why would I run this particular type of hypothesis test? It goes right along with these three right here. Why would I run any one of these? I want to run these to compare observed frequencies and categories to uh, expected frequencies um, to determine if observed frequencies are equally proportionate between categories or groups. So say for instance, I um, want to know in the first day of course selection, um, we have 10 different sections of QBA. Um, there are a total of um, 75 students who select courses in the first um, in the first day of Q, uh, in the first day of course selection. If there are 75 students um, and there's 10 uh, sections, all of them should be evenly distributed. If they're not evenly distributed, um, what is it uh, that is disproportionate? What what are the sections that are filling up faster? What are the sections that are filling up slower? Um, so that's uh, one instance of that. Um, to determine what categorical or class differences contribute to the most overall difference uh, between categories or classes, and we're going to show a, a percent chi-squared uh, for that. And then to determine if observed frequencies differ from known hypothesis distribution or population. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a lot that we can do with this. It's a very powerful test that uh, I think is underappreciated. Um, and so make sure that you pay attention to this because this is a very useful test uh, far beyond just w what it is that you're uh, doing right now. Okay, so let's um, go over the assumptions. 
these are the assumptions, which um, I accidentally put out a version of this that didn't have the assumptions written. And so make sure that you write in the assumptions if you have the version that doesn't have the assumptions written. There's one categorical variable. Um, it can be dichotomous, nominal, ordinal, or quantitative, uh, split into classes. So basically, um, you know, what we've been doing throughout the semester, just make sure that you have classes, multiple classes. Um, and if you have a quantitative variable, split it up however it's most appropriate. Then um, independence of observations. Every single observation must be a unique observation that is not dependent on anything else. Uh, it is dependent on the fact that it is in that particular category, but that's it. Uh, there must be an expected frequency of at least five in each group uh, for each of your categorical variables. If you have less than five in each group, um, that's an issue and it may result in some erroneous uh, situations there. So make sure that you have a minimum frequency of at least five in each group. And then the expected frequencies for all categories um, are equal, specifically for the goodness of fit test of equal proportions. And then the expected frequencies for all categories are reflective of a known or hypothesized distribution or a set of frequencies that may or may not be uh, equal for tests for independence or homogeneity. Um, so those are the assumptions and we'll go through those in the hypothesis test. Um, the characteristics uh, first of all, the chi-squared is never negative. So the characteristics of a chi-squared distribution are that, uh, first, the value of the chi-squared is never negative. This right here is an image uh, of a chi-squared distribution, just, just an example, um, where you have the chi-squared calc and the chi-squared crit, um, but chi-squared definitely is not a normal distribution, um, and it's never negative. So when you have a chi-squared distribution, you're going to always have an upper tail test. Next, there's a family of chi-squared distributions. As the degrees of freedom change, everything about this changes. So right here, you'll notice there's these numbers down at the bottom. The, this will spread out, and 14 could be all the way down here. Um, it, it definitely is different. Every time that anything changes in this situation, uh, the entire distribution changes. So it's a, it's a family of distributions, not just a single one set distribution. So this is not standardized. Next, uh, the chi-squared, like I said, is positively skewed. And then that it, uh, as the degrees of freedom increases, the distribution approaches a normal distribution. So um, this right here, the in this particular situation, there's only three degrees of freedom because there's three categories. Um, but if you had a hundred different categories, it would actually appear a lot more normal because there would be, um, you know, 99 degrees of freedom. Some limitations about the chi-squared is uh, if you have a small uh, frequency in cells, chi-squared might result in an erroneous conclusion. So it's always best to have a minimum of five expected and really um, observed as well. But when you start to get into smaller numbers, it, it can really uh, mess things up. Also, a small number in the denominator can make the quotient uh, quite large. So um, if you have a... Uh, small expected frequency, um, let's do this, control C, if you have a small expected frequency, uh, it can result in an erroneous chi-squared. Um, also, uh, if you have a high expected frequency, um, you can also uh, deal with having really high and erroneous chi-squared um, values. In this situation, knowing how to interpret the percent of chi-squared is very important. Okay, the smaller numbers, in my opinion, are the bigger issue and the bigger concern. So next, how do you write a null and alternative hypothesis? Okay, so how would you write a hypothesis uh, when the expected frequencies are the same between categories? We're dealing with several different types of chi-squared tests, and so we're going to have some chi-squared tests where you have the same expected frequencies between all categories, and uh, some chi-squared tests where you have different expected frequencies between all the categories. OK. 
Okay. So this right here, the null hypothesis says basically there is no difference in the proportion of the groups. Uh, you have all four of these groups. You have a uh, category of groups, group one, two, three, and four. And for the expected frequency, you have the exact same frequency, the, the exact same expected frequency for all four groups. When you have the exact same expected frequency for all four groups, you can write it, uh, the null hypothesis like this. There is no difference in the proportion of groups. So, or there's no difference between the proportion uh, of groups. So between the proportion of groups. So there's no difference between group one, two, three, or four. The proportion between all of these groups is the exact same. In other words, it's 25%, right? Uh, and then the alternative hypothesis is there is a difference in the proportion of groups uh, or between the proportion of groups. Um, how should I write a null and alternative hypothesis um, when the expected frequencies are uh, different? Um, so in this situation, you have expected frequencies down here. You've got, uh, you know, the same four groups, but the expected frequencies are 10, 12, 15, and 13. Um, and the observed frequencies are 15, 20, 10, and 5. Um, so how would I write that? There is no difference between observed values and the expected values. So, or the observed, uh, the, val the uh, observations and the number of observations number of observations and the expected number of observations for each group. And then uh, the same thing, there is a difference. There is a difference uh, between the number of observations and expected number of observations for each group. So that's how you would write the null and alternative hypotheses for these. Uh, and when you write this, make sure you actually write, uh, instead of putting each group, uh, you know, put the actual terms in there. Put the actual terms in there. Next, uh, effect size. This is a different effect size, and we'll go through this a lot more when we actually get into uh, doing the problems. Uh, but for this effect size, um, we're, it's called Kramer's V. Kramer's V is very specific to uh, looking at the um, the effect size of uh, categorical data like this. Um, and so uh, you use this formula right here. You have chi-squared, uh, which we're going to learn how to calculate chi-squared in just a little bit in the next lecture, um, divided by the number of observations, not the number of categories, but the number of observations um, and multiplied by the degrees of freedom. So this is the number of observations multiplied by the number of categories minus one. Degrees of freedom is actually a little bit more complicated than this, but uh, for this class, um, we're not getting into um, we're not getting into the more complicated chi-square stuff. We're sticking with the with the more basics. So uh, when when it changes, when the degree of freedom changes, we'll talk about that a little bit more.